steam coming out of the ground. But geothermal can mean lots of different things. So what I'm going to start off, I'm going to start with sort of increasing depth and increasing temperature. And what we can start with here is ge geothermal heat pumps. We're talking here depths of, say, less than 150 metres, temperature less than 40 degrees Celsius. And this is something that's sort of becoming more and more popular over the last few years. So what are they used for? It's like small scale domestic heating and cooling. For example, many people now worldwide are replacing their domestic boilers with geothermal heat pumps to, to heat their houses. So the question is, where can these be used? Sort of what's the global application of these? And in reality, these can be used worldwide. You just dig a sort of drill a small borehole or a trench in your back garden, you can put a heat pump in. Now let's go a bit deeper. So let's go down to about say less than two, two and a half thousand meters. And we're looking here, temperatures sort of about 40 to 100 degrees Celsius. So what's the application here? Good examples are district heating and agriculture. And here I'm sort of being based in the Netherlands, this is sort of commonly what I see here. A good example of this picture here, this is actually a geothermal installation in the center of Den Haag in, in The Hague in the Netherlands. And so these sort of temperatures, district heating. In fact, geothermal in the Netherlands was actually started by a load of farmers, greenhouse owners, looking to reduce their heating costs. They tried a geothermal project, it worked. So where do you find this? Netherlands is a good example. France, for example, the Paris Basin, where geothermal heating has been used in many districts for a long time, since the 1980s. Germany is a good example too. For example, the city of Munich, who are currently drilling lots of geothermal wells to basically replace all the fossil fuel heating in the city with geothermal energy. Then let's go a bit deeper, talking about, say, mid-temperature, down to about 4,000 metres. So here we're looking temperatures to, say, 100 to 150 degrees Celsius. And the uses here, often industrial uses, things like food processing, industrial drying, fish farming, and other industrial applications. So where do we find this? Common place of this, East Africa, using agriculture, and New Zealand. Now let's go deeper. Now, high temperature, this is what people often think of with geothermal. We're looking at, say, 4,000 metre depths, temperatures over 150 degrees Celsius. And this is where you get examples like this with, say, steam coming out of the ground. I mean, this is a picture from Iceland, a geothermal plant in Iceland. And what's this used for? Commonly power generation. So where do you find this? Good examples, Iceland, as many people are familiar with, but also Western United States, California, Utah, Nevada, and Turkey is a good example as well. So you can see here, geothermal comes in many sorts of different geysers, different depths and temperatures, and different uses. And it's worth mentioning here, these are sort of average depths, but of course, if you find these temperatures close to the surface with a higher geothermal gradient, it obviously can be more beneficial. So now that's a little bit about the applications. But how about, how about how it works, geothermal systems? Because of course, to get the energy, you need some sort of geothermal system. And I've got this little diagram here from the US Department of Energy. You can really break down geothermal into two sorts of systems. The first one is direct use, where, for example, you drill a borehole, maybe hot spring an example. And what you do is you produce the hot water directly. So the native formation fluids, hot water, produce to the surface, and you use it. However, more commonly is this sort of system, what we call a hydrothermal or an, an enhanced system. Now, these use a doublet. And a good example of this little picture here is where we have one well where you inject a working fluid, commonly water. People are also looking at carbon dioxide now, but water is a common one. And you pump it here cold. It passes through the formation through the natural porosity and permeability. Heat's transferred to the working fluid. Then you produce it from a producing well. And often then it's passed through a heat exchanger because you can imagine you're passing water through the formation. It'll be dissolving salts, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, you're passing this through surface pipe work may cause corrosion scaling problems. You don't want that. So you pass it through a heat exchanger into a working fluid, and then the working fluid is used for whatever purposes you're using it for. For example, heating, industrial uses, electricity generation, so on and so forth. So that's a little bit on how it works. It's also worth doing a comparison to say other renewables. For example, I'll start with the pros. Now a good pro with geothermal is, in many ways, geothermal is potentially available everywhere. As we all know, you drill deeper into the earth, it gets hotter. So it's really just a case of drilling down deep enough till you've got the temperature you want and the porous permeable formation, and you can extract that energy. Another benefit, it can provide a constant base load because the temperature of the earth is pretty constant. It doesn't vary with time. So in terms of any production, 
you've got like a constant, reliable base load production. Another benefit being a closed loop system, it's practically zero emissions. It's sort of just circulating water, no gas being produced, zero emission. And also it's got very little reliance on environmental factors. I mean, let's compare to sort of solar and wind. Obviously with a solar plant, you only get energy production if it's sunny. With like a wind turbine, you only get energy production if it's windy. And if it's not sunny or it's not windy, you're in trouble. Geothermal, you don't have that because it's a pretty constant source of energy. Equally, once it's installed, it's a pretty small footprint. You might remember the previous slide I showed that building in Den Haag. Sort of your geothermal facility, once it's been realized, drilled, put on production, it can be as small as a small building. So almost unnoticeable. In fact, that example in the Hague, you didn't know what it was. When you go past it on the tram, you wouldn't even know what it is. It's that sort of inconspicuous. And also in terms of project life, I mean, the lifetimes of these projects can be 30 plus years. So a, a long-term reliable source of energy. But of course, that's the pros. There are always cons. So what about the cons? One sort of challenge at the moment is we all know drilling wells is expensive. So actually realizing a geothermal project where you've got to drill one, two, three, maybe four or five wells is going to cost a fair bit of money. And of course, the return on this is much longer. Of course, hot water's not as high value as uh, oil and gas, so the return period is much longer. And also, lack of public understanding and social acceptance, because you can imagine wind turbines, solar panels are reasonably well accepted, but if the average member of the public sees a drilling rig popping up in their back garden, they're going to ask questions, maybe start protesting. Also, there's potential environmental effects, because you can imagine here we are pumping water into the subsurface, changing the pressure, we're extracting water. This is going to change your pore pressure. So potential geomechanical implications and can result in seismicity, as has been seen recently in Strasbourg and then historically in uh, Basel in Switzerland and some other places too. Another challenge is the infrastructure, because we need to deliver heat or connect to an electricity grid. Maybe it, the heat grid is not in place or the source of geothermal energy is away from your power lines. So it can often be challenging to connect to existing infrastructure or maybe the required infrastructure isn't in place. Another sort of con is it's a relatively young industry. I mean, in many ways, it's been geothermal energy been used for a long time. Think back to the Romans in the sort of uh, zero BC bath, for example, hot springs. But it's sort of the big growth in geothermal has only been in the last few years. So it's relatively young compared to other renewables. So with less expertise to realize projects and still a lot to learn. So there's some of the pros and cons. You're probably wondering what, what's the global installed capacity? So here I've got a little chart of sort of the installed capacity of various renewables going from 2016 to 2020, and also the changing capacity in 2020. So I've plotted here hydropower in blue, we've got wind in grey, solar, which I think is yellow, then we've got bioenergy, and this thin sliver at the top is geothermal. So at the moment, in the whole mix of various renewable technologies, geothermal is very, very small. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to zoom in on this. And here you can see the growth in geothermal from... 2009 up to 2020. And what you'll see in that time, it's basically increased by 50%. It's growing rapidly and growth is only increasing. So it's sort of like encouragement from all national governments. So geothermal in terms of growth is really growing. It's small, but it's growing rapidly. Tom, quick question for you. Is that yeah. geothermal, uh, is that gigawatts thermal, gigawatts power or both? I will have to go and check. I believe this graph is electricity, so power. But uh, I say you can check that and get back to you and find out. But it's really just to demonstrate the growth. And if you look at, say, your plot as a sort of graph for heating, you'd see very similar. Sort of a good example, many sort of, here in the Netherlands, many municipalities are moving from gas heating to encouraging geothermal heating. So the heat growth is very, very similar. Now, you're probably wondering, where is all this happening? So what I've got to put the graph here is sort of, the sort of current global installed capacity in 2020, and which countries are the largest geothermal users? And often when people see this graph, it surprises them because look at the biggest user or the biggest installed capacity for geothermal. It's the United States. You might not think that, but it is. So the Western United States in particular, California, Nevada, Utah, these sorts of areas, California is a big generator of geothermal electricity. And then the other countries you're looking at are sort of many sorts of the traditional areas, volcanically active areas, the Pacific Ring of Fire, Iceland's in there, of course, Middle Atlantic Ridge. And then you have sort of a final graph for the others. So this is the current installed capacity. 
So now, that's a little bit of overview on geothermal, what it is, how it works. And of course, the question people often ask is the economics. How do the sums add up? And I'm in a meeting on you. Oh. And say, so just request if anybody's uh, got their microphone unmuted, please could you uh, just mute it to avoid any background noise. So, the economics of geothermal. So, this chart, many of you might recognise from your sort of oil and gas experience. So what I've plotted here is a, a graph of sort of geothermal project risk on the, uh, on the y-axis versus the various stages in sort of realisation of a project. And I've also got sort of the cumulative development cost here. So what you notice here is sort of that the risk return cost graph is very similar to the kind of graph you see in hydrocarbon exploration. So it starts off with an initial stage or pre-survey and exploration where often you'll be doing, say, desk studies, work on existing data. And at this stage, yeah, project risk is high, but the actual expenditure is quite low. But then you'll eventually make the decision to drill. So now you're drilling sort of exploration wells, test drilling. Now, this is where the costs start to mount up. Of course, as you're drilling, you're also reducing your risk because you're getting more and more knowledge of the subsurface. Now, the next stage you get to is the development stage. And of course, this is where you're putting in your development wells, surface infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. And now the risk is reducing further, but your cost is really mounting up. And the question is, how long does this stage? So how long are you sort of spending without really getting any income, but just having outlay? Commonly with a geothermal project, this is in the order of, say, two to four years. Now then, you've got your project realised, you're starting up, and you're actually operating delivering energy, maintaining the facility. Now, of course, you can imagine your costs have leveled out and potentially this period can be quite long. It can be up to 20 years, like a long operating phase, low costs and steady returns. Now, of course, the challenge in all this, the question is, how can we reduce the risk? How can we reduce the cost and the realisation time? So this part of the graph. And how can you extend your project life this part of the graph? So you're spending as little time spending money, as much time as possible making money. This is a good question we can, we can ask ourselves. Now, the next question we can ask is, in terms of the actual cost of power per kilowatt hour, how does geothermal stack up? So what I've got plotted here is various examples of methods to generate electricity and their levelized cost per kilowatt hour. And it's worth mentioning this is without any subsidies involved either. This is actually the cost exclusive subsidies. So what you see, I mean, geothermal here, once it's installed, the actual cost per kilowatt hour is actually pretty competitive. It's, it's economic. But the problem is the risks. I mean, the risks in geothermal development, as you can probably imagine, are much higher than many other renewables. For example, think about the risk of a wind turbine. You know it's windy, so you can put it there. Think about the risk of solar. You know it's sunny, so you can put it there. But think about the risks of geothermal. You can't actually see the formation. So you actually have to drill with a relatively high risk in terms of economics and also HSC activity before you can prove the viability of a geothermal resource. And equally, imagine the costs involved in drilling a well. The return on your investment can be much longer. You'll get it, but it's much longer. So again, the question is, how can we reduce these risks and improve these returns to help with the economics of geothermal? So that's a little bit on the economics. Now, what I'd like to do now is sort of compare sort of geothermal to what we know oil and gas. How do the two industries compare? And one thing I'd like to say is in many ways, if you think about it, the geothermal industry has a very, very similar objective to the oil and gas industry, because what is our objective? You can really sum it up as this, so the safe economic extraction of a subsurface energy resource with a minimum of adverse effects on the environment, which I think I, is, I personally think is a good way of putting this. So in many ways, oil and gas, geothermal, we've got very similar objectives. But it's always good to compare them. Let's compare the two industries. I'll start with oil and gas, because as we all know, oil and gas industry, an established extensive worldwide industry. And in terms of sort of the players in, in the industry, we've got major operators down to small independents and everything in between. And equally to support that, these operators, we've also got a well-established supporting industry, well, well-established service industry. And these industries, many, many years of knowledge. I mean, over 150 years of knowledge. And of course, you've got 150 years of knowledge. Over that time, you've built up all the well-established methodologies, your best practices. You've got the regulation in place and all the procedures so you can safely and economically utilise your oil and gas resources. Now, let's compare to geothermal. 
In geothermal itself, in reality, it's been around a long time. Say so the Romans were using geothermal energy, as I mentioned, baths, for example. But in terms of sort of significant growth in the industries, really only happened in the last few years, maybe the last 10 years. Of course, it's still small compared to oil and gas. Because it's still small, it's very, very few big operators. I mean, there's only a handful of big global operators. Most of the industry is just like small, very small players, very small independents. And of course, you've got small industry. This means your knowledge base is going to be quite small. It is growing, but there's still gaps. And what you see is a special, especially gaps in, say, subsurface knowledge, operational knowledge, HSE, and so on and so forth. And because of this, in geothermal, it's like there's fewer accepted best practice methodologies. The regulation might not necessarily be in place. Maybe you haven't got the procedures to sort of safely and economically utilizing resources. So this leads on to my next question, really. Can oil and gas contribute? What I'd like to ask here is let's look at what we in oil and gas consider to be important. What's important for oil and gas exploration? What do you need to know? We can start off by saying, for example, what's important? So where are the hydrocarbons? How much are there? Is it going to produce? And what's it going to cost? And again, what controls this? As we all know, your volumes, things like your reservoir structure, thickness and aerial extent, and your porosity and saturation. Is it going to produce your, your permeability, your recovery factor? And of course, all these tie into what's it going to cost to produce these reserves? And are these reserves going to be economic? Now, let's compare this to geothermal. What's important for geothermal? Now, normally when you say what's important for geothermal, sort of three things, and maybe four spring to mind. So temperature, permeability, porosity, and the presence of fractures. Of course, what of these do we want? So do you want high or low? And it sort of is fairly logical inference to say, we want high, we want lots of them. And the question is, why do we want lots of them? Because with geothermal, in many ways, flow is everything. Because high temperature, you have more heat produced. Good permeability, you have greater flow, so you get more energy out per unit time. Effective porosity is good because bigger surface area, more heat transfer. And in fractures, some ways, give you the benefit of all of these because you have fractures, large surface area per unit volume, good permeability. It's going to help your flow and help your energy production. But the question is, is that all? Is there anything else? And there is. Because what else haven't we thought of? Things, for example, like, is lithology and geochemistry important? Is formation water properties important? Is your formation and reservoir structure important? And your geomechanical properties, are these important? And the answer is yes. Because let's think about lithology and geochemistry. Think here with a doublet-based system, we are circulating water through the subsurface formation. And of course, circulating water might well contain dissolved salts and chemicals. I mean, how are these going to react with your subsurface fluids and your subsurface mineralogy? Is it going to maybe scale your formation, plug your pores, and reduce your porosity permeability and reduce your energy production? What about your formation water? Because of course, we all know subsurface water is saline, dissolved solids, salts. Sometimes these are radioactive. And of course, we're producing hot water from the subsurface to the surface that water is going to cool down. What's going to happen to your dissolved salts? They're going to precipitate. They're going to sort of reduce the diameter of your tubing. Maybe some of these salts are radioactive. You'll have sort of radioactive material. You've got to deal with it. And it goes without saying, salt, salty water is corrosive. It dissolves casing, steel casing. So of course, you're going to have potentially a corrosion problem. Also, your formation and reservoir structure, why is that important? Is your well in the optimal position? because better location, better porosity permeability, better flow, more heat. And equally important is the water you're injecting going where you think it is. I always like to make the analogy, sort of, we have two wells here, then your next door neighbour drills one. But you're pumping down your well, it's producing from his well, you've got all the costs, he's got all the benefits. So it's important to know where your water is going. And also things like your geomechanical properties, because if you think about it, we are changing the subsurface pore pressure, if you change your pore pressure, that can have influences. Can it reactivate faults? Can it cause seismicity? Equally, you're drawing down the formation, reducing the pressure. Will it result in sanding, for example? Well more stability when you're drilling the wells. Are you drilling the wells in optimal drilling parameters to keep them stable? So you actually reach TD. All these questions. And equally, is there anything else? As I mentioned, geothermal industry is relatively young. What don't we know? And what have we still got to learn? Maybe there's a lot. Who knows what we'll find in the future.
So now I'd like to talk about sort of when realizing your geothermal project, a bit about subsurface data. And the question is, we said knowing the subsurface is important, but how much do we know? And really looking at what's commonly recorded in terms of sort of log data, subsurface information in a geothermal well. And until recently, what we've seen, it's been limited because the economics of geothermal can be very tight and subsurface data acquisition has been seen as expensive. And sometimes, often what we'll only see is a gamma ray and a mud log. Maybe you'll get a resistivity. And quite often these will be used for identifying your formations of interest of when to stop drilling when you're in the formation you want to produce. So we need to know things like porosity and permeability, but commonly they'll be referred from other data, offset wells, not directly measured. Of course, often we'll need to know flow. Here in the Netherlands, for example, is one of the requirements for the well is they have to perform a well test. So we'll do a well test, measure the bulk flow of the well. But of course, that's the bulk flow of the well. It doesn't necessarily tell us where the flow is coming from. So what does this mean? It means potentially quite a high local uncertainty on formation properties. So what does this mean in reality? So what I'd like to show you now is an example of sort of how this data is acquired. And what I'm referring to in here is what's commonly used in the Netherlands, which is where I'm sitting, of course, which is the NLOG Dutch subsurface database. Some of you might be familiar with it, but of course we've got analogs in, in the UK, sort of the uh, OGA database, Norway's got the NFES database, of course, and many countries have these national data repositories. And in some ways in the Netherlands, we're very lucky because it's open access, anybody can go in there. And any data that's older than five years goes into the public domain. It's a very comprehensive database. And here's like a screenshot of the main page of the Netherlands and all these dots represent wells. Of course, geothermal, we generally drill onshore. So what I've done is zoomed, zoomed onto the onshore area and here is all the wells in the Netherlands in terms of development, appraisal, exploration and other. And this is all the wells drilled since about 1850, to be honest. I actually found a well from 1850 earlier today I was looking on this. What I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna put on the geothermal areas, the license areas on top of this. Now these green areas, green shaded areas are the geothermal license areas. And what you might notice if you look closely, we've got a couple of areas with good data coverage, say down around Rotterdam and up around Groningen, great data coverage. But you see some of the other areas, there's very little data. And why is that? Because these are areas that, in, of course, many of these boreholes were drilled for oil and gas exploration. And let's say you drilled around Utrecht, you drilled a well dry, are you going to spend any more money drilling any exploration wells? No, you're not. But now this is a big area of interest for geothermal prospects. But we've got a lack of data because there's been very little exploration. So what does this mean? It means basically a lot of uncertainty in these geothermal areas that have historically had very little subsurface exploration. It's not only the Netherlands, many other places, other countries are facing exactly the same challenges. So now this is where sort of the value of data comes in. So what I'm going to present now is a case study on something I worked on a few years ago. And it's probably best to show the first slide. So to give an introduction here, this is a fractured geothermal well that's filled a few years ago. And we had like an open hole interval of 113 meters. And the assumption was made, the majority of the interval was gonna flow, produce geothermal fluid. What we did at the time, we ran a few logs. So we ran a nuclear magnetic resonance log and we ran an acoustic log and a gamma ray log. And this is what we got plotted up here. And what we found from these logs is that we had porosities up to about 15% and a permeability of up to about 200 millidarcies. So what I'm gonna do now is just take you through the plot just to sort of uh, give a bit of explanation of what we're seeing here. So the first track is the gamma ray. So for those of you used to looking at log data, gamma ray going from low to high. If you have a low gamma ray, it means a clean formation. If you have a high of gamma ray, it means a shaley formation. So what you want is a clean formation. Now the next track is the NMR data basically sort of the T, what we call the T2 spectra. And the way to look at this is to look at this in terms of pore size distribution. So if you have lots of peaks towards the left here, that means small pores, so shales. If you have lots of peaks towards the right, that means large pores, so connected porosity. And peaks in the middle are what we sort of class as irreducible porosity, like small to medium sized pores. And then we can relate sort of the area underneath each of these peaks to the porosity. So what we see here is anything shaded in yellow is movable porosity. Anything shaded in blue is irreducible porosity, and anything shaded in brownie type color is clay brown water. We see here, looking at this straight away, I've got the acoustic porosity plotted as well. It's showing a pretty good agreement with the NMR porosity. But straight away, if we do a quick net to gross on this, what you'll see 
I've done some arbitrary cutoffs of 5% minimum velocity, 2% for two, 2 million dice permeability. We see straight away, we've gone down from 118 metres down to 36 and a half metres that's going to produce. So our net to gloss is 32%. Significant reduction. But what we did next, we ran a production log. So we ran the spinners, pressure and temperature, just to identify where the flow is actually coming from. Now, the tracks look at here are these two tracks here, this, these two curves here. So these curves are the spinners. And the way to look at this, this is like low flow, high flow. And the temperature, when you get a pest perturbation in this differential temperature curve, this is an indication when you're getting flow coming into the well. And we can see straight away, we've now gone from 36 meters of potential flow to only about one meter is actually flowing. Now, the question is why? Why is this happening? But even though we have like a fairly limited data set here, it's enough to do some out of some work to find out what was going on in the formation and why that only interval is flowing. So what I've plotted here is some of the work. And the first thing we can look at here is this track here. And this track here represents the acoustic waveform data recorded by the acoustic tool. This is actually what's called a variable density log of the trace. And straight away, we can see here, we've lost all the energy, basically zero amplitude coming in. The next thing we do is what's called an acoustic reflection image. And this is indicated by this track here. So for those of you not familiar with the theory, this is recorded with the borehole acoustic tool. You can look at it almost like surface seismic turned on its side. So you have the acoustic transmitter in the tool as your source. It emits energy in the formation. You get your directed waves, such as compressional and shear, but you also get energy propagating directly through the formation. And if this reaches or intersects a feature, a planar feature with an acoustic impedance, it'll reflect back to the tool, the tool receivers. And then by applying standard seismic techniques, you can generate one of these acoustic reflection images. And what this represents is the middle of the image is the well bore itself. And either side is 25 meters either side of the well bore. And the first thing you can notice, we've got a major reflector here. Now, if we project this reflector to the well bore, you'll see it's intersecting exactly where that flow is coming in. So we look at this and think, okay, you've got a major planar reflecting feature in the formation that's happened to be intersecting the well bore where you've got ma maximum flow coming in. What could this be? It's like an open fracture or a fault. So now we look to this well, start off with 113 meters potential interval. Net to gross gave us 30%, 36 meters. And now we're down to one meter. It's been explained by knowing now it's potentially a fault that's causing all our production in this well. Now, the next question is, what are the implications of this? So if we didn't know this, how would this affect the success of a project? Well, for starters, you've only got one meter flowing. You might get poor performance than expected. Your actual geothermal fluid production is much lower than planned. And of course, if your geothermal fluid production is much lower than planned, potentially this is going to mean lower economic return. Of course, lower economic return, less attractive to your investors. Now, let's say we didn't have geochemical knowledge. Let's say we didn't know our geochemistry. Let's say our formation fluids. Let's say this fault scaled up, it was plugged. What's that going to do to our production? It's basically going to stop our production. So we're in trouble then. And equally, let's say we didn't know any geothermal properties or any geochemical properties of the fluid. Is this water corrosive? It goes through our completion and casing. Is it going to dissolve our casing, causing maybe big problems with our completions? Let's say we didn't know our geo geomechanical properties. We had unexpected solids production. Let's say sand production. And many of these projects require an ESP, a submersible pump to produce. As many of us know, you get sand through an ESP, they don't like it, it tends to wear them out. Is it gonna cause premature pump failure? Equally in this example, we've got a fault. Let's say we get our injection production pressures less than optimal and it reactivates that fault. Then we've got seismicity. And that is a big problem because seismicity can actually stop projects dead in their tracks, as has been seen recently in Strasbourg and historically in Basel in Switzerland. So these are implications. And also, what else don't we know? There might be more, but we just don't know that may only become apparent many years in the future. So the question is, how can this knowledge benefit geothermal? Now, what I'd like to do here in terms of economic benefits. So me being based in the Netherlands, when a geothermal well is being planned in the Netherlands, we have to go through this procedure called doublet calc. And this is actually a Dutch government program where some key reservoir properties are put in, into this calculator and it gives you an estimate of your geothermal energy production. So what I've done here is I've taken the base case and this is the certain permeability, net to gross, aquifer thickness. 
and just run the numbers. And with our 0.8 net to gross, we come out with a geothermal production of 8.33 megawatts. Now I've done a thought experiment. What's going to happen? Let's say, for example, we had subsurface knowledge and we could steer the well into the optimal zone and we in increased our net to gross by 5%, which is, I think, perfectly achievable, going from 80% to 85% net to gross. Of course, many of us are familiar with steering, so using logs such as deep azimuthal resistivity, azimuthal density, nuclear magnetic resonance, and we keep the well bore in the most permeable, porous zone to increase our net to gross, increase our geothermal fluid production. So now we've gone to a net to gross of 85% at our P50 case. Our base case was 8.33 megawatts. And by steering the well, 5% extra net to gross, we've gone to 8.77 megawatts. So we've increased by 440 kilowatts. Now, that's the number. So what is 440 kilowatts in real terms? And it just happens to be the power output of a Tesla Model S. Now, if you relate that to actual sort of money, so at the moment, the wholesale electricity price is about 10 euro cents per kilowatt hour. So over the course of the year, that adds up to 400,000 euros of extra revenue. Now we've steered the well, not necessarily only the net to gross that's going to increase, it's probably reasonable to expect we'll increase our permeability as well. So here, I've gone with a 5% increase in permeability. So 250 milliadarses to 263 milliadarses. So now we've gone from our base case of 8.33, megawatts to 9.07 megawatts. So now we've got another 740 kilowatts, which is basically over our base case, an extra 650,000 euros. And of course, you multiply that over 20 years, life of a project, that's potentially a significant amount of revenue. So now to conclude. So what I've hopefully shown in this presentation is that geothermal is actually a viable, economically friendly, uh, environmentally friendly economic energy source. And unfortunately, how at the moment, often sort of subsurface evaluation for geothermal is currently somewhat limited. But what I've hopefully shown here is that we all work in oil and gas and sort of the principles and the methodologies we've derived over the years are equally applicable to geothermal. But unfortunately, as I said, sort of at the moment, subsurface data acquisitions often seem as an unnecessary expense and therefore it's minimized. But measuring some of these properties would be very beneficial maybe not immediately, because some of the benefits of having this information may only become apparent years in the future. And of course, by the time we got to years in the future, when the wells are completed, rigs have gone, completions are in, it may not be possible to acquire this data. And even if it is, it might be very expensive. And of course, we know this information, you've got the sort of potential to actually increase your heat production and the economic viability of your projects and efficiency by optimizing them. What I'm gonna do now, leave with a final thought because we're all SPE members and we are all subsurface experts. And of course, being subsurface experts, we as an industry, we've got the knowledge to make geothermal energy technically and economically viable and a success. And on that, I'm gonna do some acknowledgements. I'd like to thank the SPE, of course, thank Baker Hughes and also NGRISO. And finally, your feedback is very important. So uh, what I'd encourage you all to do is please just get your phone out, scan that QR code on the bottom right, and that will take you to a web page on the SPDL site where you can uh, rate this presentation. Please give me your feedback. I, I find this very, very useful because it will be definitely benefit all the future chapters who will uh, have this presentation in the future and help me to uh, make it a useful presentation to share the information. On that, I'll say thank you very much, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Thanks, Tom. That's really good. Very interesting indeed. Um, nice way you made the parallel between oil and gas very powerfully. Yeah, um, yeah there have been a few questions in the chat. Oh, uh, right. Let's have a look. Let me just see what's come up. Those, what's gone now? Um, oh, come on, chat. Can you can you see the chat? Go ahead. I, I can. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'll go through questions. Yeah. All right. So, so let's. Um, okay. So I think the, let's start at the top. There was. Uh, Vincent uh, said, what's the cost of geothermal in dollars per kilowatt hour? It's a rather broad question, but is there, can you give a stab to that answer? Oh, that's a good question, because at the moment, I mean, I can't give exact numbers, but what I can say at the moment is many projects do require subsidies to get off the ground. So at the moment, sort of the cost of realising the project can be higher than the, the return. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's variable. I mean, good examples like Iceland, for example, where you've got very high temperatures near to the surface, where you only have to drill relatively shallow to get very high temperatures, this just, just works. And the sort of the return is 
way uh, way over sort of the actual investment. I mean, the other the opposite to this is the sort of the current situation in the Netherlands and other northern European countries where you've got low temperature geothermal down about two and a half thousand meters. And at the moment, sort of the cost of realizing these projects is unfortunately more than the actual return. So these do rely on subsidies, at least at the start of the drilling. But over the long term, they do cover their costs, but they do need upfront subsidies. Very interesting. Um, Thank you. Let's go on to the next question then. Uh, Alain. Um, to everyone, but let's just go through this. Um, there were many projects in the 1970s and an important research program at the European Union. Yep. Has an analysis been made of these projects which were designed to last 30 years? Yeah, I think the best way to look at that is, I mean, I agree completely, geothermal is, is right, it's not young. Um, but it's really, so the best way of putting it, it's only really got the attention and big growth in the last few years. And sort of, in terms of projects in the 70s, a very good example is the Paris Basin projects. So district heating in the suburbs of Paris where these were correctly realised in the 1970s, and they are still going strong. And this is a good example, and also some other areas. So has analysis been made of these projects designed to last 30 years? Good question. I mean, I personally haven't been involved in them, but the fact they are still going 30 years later and still producing heat for these cities, Paris especially, is a good sort of example of them working, I'd say. Okay, so Barney Brennan is saying, a tip, what's the typical uptime for an injector producer pair given the corrosion and sanding issues. And how does this affect reliability? That's another good question, because it, it does tend to vary. What we've been seeing, at least over here, sort of anecdotally, is in terms of corrosion, things like this, I've heard sort of five years, five to seven years with the initial projects in the Netherlands, they start to realise they're having problems. And also in terms of ESPs, the sort of the wells are having sanding, ESPs commonly the operators plan for life of maybe five years. Sometimes we'll be pulling after two years, three years, other times it'll be a lot longer. And it really, a lot of it sort of goes back to sort of what sort of prior work and uh, interpretation the operators did. And what we'll find nowadays is the basing a lot of sort of uh, knowledge from these early wells where they didn't think, oh, it's easy, we'll punch two holes in the ground, you put water down, it gets hot, brilliant. Then they realized recently now we realized it's a lot more complicated. And we're winning things like, for example, GRE line casing or high chrome casing. They'll be sort of looking at the completion sand screens or perforated completions, depending on the formation properties, to avoid many of these problems in the first place. And also equally in sort of the corrosion mitigation, things like chemical injection. So sort of anti-corrosion chemicals to limit, say, corrosion and scaling. Yeah. I mean, it comes down to your point that, uh, that the idea is to try and cost save costs wherever you can at the start of the mm. project, because these things don't tend to have a very good rate of return. So That's you're, true, yes. you're caught between this cleft stick because you need more information or you're just taking high risks and things go wrong. Indeed, and, indeed. Uh, yeah, there's, there's no right answer. As a matter of fact, there's a guy called Ivan Das at Raver Bank, which you might have even known or not, um, that he was on a, on a panel I was chairing uh, over in the States. And he was saying that, that they, the bank uh, um, had investments in, in all the different renewable technologies. And he said the one he, he feared the most was the geothermal because... Whereas with a solar project, they always did 15 year projects. Yeah. He said, you, you'd sign the contract, you've done the analysis, you signed the contract, and you wouldn't hear from the company for 12 years. <laughs> and the same with wind. But he said, when it came to geothermal, he said, we were normally finding they'd be coming back to us in three or four years with some requests for some money for something that had gone wrong. And he said that really did make it much harder to, to have an equitable view of yeah. the geothermal projects. And this is Holland, they rave banks in Holland. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that you're right. That's a big challenge in the industry because uh, it is a high risk. The fact we all know drilling holes in the ground is is a high risk, and there's a risk you might not find something, and the risk that things might go wrong. Yeah. Oh, Adrian Gregory, how many geothermal wells are operational in the Netherlands? It's about twenty five pairs at the moment. Twenty five doublers. Okay, it's a nice easy answer. Martin Rylance, with producer and injector pairs, how much of an issue is short circuiting? This seems like something of a Goldilocks problem. It can be, because I mean, I mentioned earlier, sort of, you want porosity and permeability and good porosity, because so sort of good permeability, that's good flow. But equally, I mean, a good example here is, let's say you have like a long, let's say you know, a thousand meter lateral, and you let's say you've got a fracture zone in the middle of that lateral. Of course, this is going to have a higher permeability. And let's say this continuous to your, your producer well. And of course, that's going to have preferential flow, and over time, you may well have a cold front breakthrough preferentially along that particular fracture zone or higher perm zone. And then you're just going to be circulating cold water because it hasn't got any chance to pick up any heat. So this can be a big problem. And this is where sort of people are starting to look at things like ICDs 
to sort of optimize the injectivity on the wellbore or the flow on the wellbore. Yeah, ICDs, inflow control devices. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, yeah, that's too many acronyms. Yeah, <laughs> things like inflow control devices to actually control yeah. where the injection and production is coming from the wells to sort of balance the flow between your doublet. So you get the optimum sort of heat transfer to the working fluid. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, a couple more questions, I think. PE, whoever PE is, hmm. you haven't mentioned payback time, payback time. With, with other investments. Do you want to mention payback time? Yeah, this is a good good question. I haven't got an exact number for you, but I've heard anecdotally people look at 10 years, so it's not quick, is the best way of putting it. And that's sort of going back to your observation, Tim, of why banks can be a bit reluctant to invest in these because the payback time is quite long. It's not like an oil and gas project where once the oil starts flowing, it's a high return investment and you'll get lots of money. Though equally, it's a high cost investment. Geothermal is lower return over a longer period. I mean, yeah. once it does start returning, it's good, but that payback time is quite long. Adrian, again, on geothermal best practice, what have you found that oil and gas knows any better? <laughs> That's a good, good question. Good question. What I, the way I'm going to answer this one is what I've seen with lots of these small operators is they tend to reinvent the wheel every time. So it's like they're not building up a sort of a list of best practices of how to drill a geothermal well, like say you use this casing design, you use this bit size, you use this drilling merge, you so on and so forth. So in terms of best practices, it's really sort of optimizing drilling things. But of course, we've got to be careful when you approach the geothermal operators because often we're seen as a big bad oil and gas companies trying, trying to tell them what to do. So there is some sort of, a, let's say, being sort of careful in many ways. But I think there's a lot we can actually share with the industry and help them to help to optimize their returns. And equally, we can learn from them because they look at something different. And there's, there's things we don't know that they've learned, of course. I guess they probably more, they, maybe, maybe they got more experience of drilling very hot fluid, very hot rock and hot fluids. Yeah. I don't know. Um, some, drilling some ways, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing with geothermal because people straight away think of really hot rock steam coming out of the ground. But a lot of the growth here in Europe, of course, is actually low temp stuff with yeah. temperatures less than 100 degrees Celsius because yeah. for district heating, you only need about 80, 80 degrees Celsius and that's enough. Uh, Paul Choter says, analysts predict that geothermal will only contribute no more than 2% of global energy production by 2050. Is this your view or is something they've missed? Good question, good question. The question is how, how it's going to be used for. And I mean, the way I can look at this is, I mean, looking at the example here in the Netherlands of gas, and at the moment, we all know that growing gas fields being closed down. And sort of what's the biggest use of gas in the Netherlands? It's actually heating, space heating. It's something like 50% of the Dutch gas supply is used for heating. So in many ways, geothermal is an excellent replacement for that. If you're sort of an area where it's going to be viable because you, if you have a district heating system in place, you can get the hot water in your district heating system and it's replacing space heating. But you're right, it's not going to replace everything because it simply can't. In many ways, the sort of the economics, to, as mentioned, power generation, electricity, you're looking at high temperatures going to standard systems, 150 degrees plus, not everywhere can be drilled economically to those sort of depths and there's no guarantees you're going to have a a porous permeable reservoir anyway you can do things like say fracking enhanced geothermal to create a reservoir but that's got its own own challenges so you're right can it meet all the requirements no definitely not but it has it has its application and in europe at least a good application is heating it's, it's almost ideally suited for it in my opinion Arnie, another question. What's your view on reusing abandoned oil and gas wells? Oh, very good question. This is something people are looking at sort of intensely over here. And in many ways, it can be because often, good example, my experience in the Netherlands, they're going down to 2,000, 2,500 metres deep. The abandoned oil and gas reservoirs, depleted reservoirs, which are good porosity, good permeability, good temperature. So in some ways, they're ideal. But there's other challenges because we think about oil and gas well. When we get down to TD, we're looking at maybe five and seven eighths inch holes, eight and a half inch holes, and they're not very big. As I mentioned beforehand, for geothermal wells, flow is everything. So the bigger your well diameter, the more flow you can get. And also think about how they're completed. Often steel casing, we're producing hot salty water. Hot salty water is not good for steel casing. So yeah, there's definite sort of applications here, but there's also considerations. And sometimes it can be suited, other times it can't be suited. So it's it's really on a case by case basis. So those those twenty five uh, injector producer pairs that you were talking about. So what 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 uh, the, is the final uh, tubing size for those then? Uh, I've seen some of them sixteen inches, but, and some of them are twelve and a quarter. 
but they tend to go for large. Two and a half thousand meters deep. Yeah. Right. Sixteen inches. At I've, the seen, I've seen sixteen inches at the bottom, but commonly like twelve and a quarter or maybe eight and a half. But sure. these right. guys tend to try to fill big wells because yeah. literally flow is everything. Uh, Natik, uh, what kind of solutions exist for improving drilling targets and siting? It's it's really sort of what we've been doing for years. It's sort of sort of reservoir navigation, steering your wells, and in many ways, what we've been using for a long time to steer wells in oil and gas wells. So I think the solutions exist already. It's just applying them to geothermal. Okay, and I think this is referring to Ever Technology, is it? Fred? It is, it will be, yes. Yeah, subsurface closed loop. Oh, this is a good one, because I've, I've got a fair bit of awareness of this and I've seen them present. And it's an intriguing project, because in many ways, this is actually making geothermal, particularly anywhere, viable in theory because you don't need a reservoir and you're basically sort of drilling a subsurface heat exchanger in many ways it's like you sort of have your sort of your pilot well and sort of your fan out then you have other wells connecting so really it is a subsurface heat exchange you're not flowing any any liquid through the formation itself you've got no concern about say pressure changes sort of seismicity any of that if they can make it work it i think it's going to be a game changer I just, oh, Steve Anara has just come in. I just think the, the issue of um, this is a, it becomes a purely conduction calculation, doesn't it? That's, yes. It's about yeah. the area of the pipe that you're um, you're putting in the ground. Yeah. And that, that's another thing I didn't touch on. Of course, if you think about conduction, rock has got a certain heat capacity. The actual physical matrix is a certain capacity to store heat, and rock has a certain conductivity because you can imagine when we're producing heat from the formation, we're cooling it down, and that heat has to be replenished. And of course, it gets replenished from the center of the earth by the radioactive decay. And over time, you're going to cool your reservoir down. And so therefore, to keep your project viable, you've got to manage your flow through the reservoir and your heat production. So your rate of replenishment is similar to your rate of uh, sort of extraction. And sort of one potential complication to consider this ever idea is if you extract your heat too fast, you'll just have a large cooled area around the, sort of the heat exchanger, subsurface heat exchanger that's going to basically take a long time to recover. So I think it's going to need careful management to actually make these things work over time. Yeah, because the contrast with the, 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 the doublet that you're referring to is it the, the area that the, uh, the, heat, the fluid has uh, in contact with the rock is much, much higher, isn't it? And over yeah, a yeah. much wider area. So yeah. that, that's the, the, the challenge is how does something like ever work when it has such a small surface area compared with exactly. the simple exactly. idea of uh, using exactly. rock I mean, I mean, just to give an idea of sort of the spacing on a geothermal well, normally at TD, you're looking about maybe two kilometres between the two wells. And of course, I mean, that's two wells, so you've got like a flow pass between these two wells. But equally, you can manage the reservoir, say, for example, by drilling another well. So you sort of, for uh, a few years, flow between two wells, and then you'll just let these closes in for a few years, let the temperature recover, and you flow between the other two wells. So you've got a different heat path. So you, so you can certainly manage the reservoir to sort of, well, one party's cooling, the other party's replenishing, and that can be done. Whereas I think with ever, it's going to be more challenging unless you've got sort of like uh, closable, you can close some of these side tracks and these laterals to let some recover while others are being extracted. Yeah, yeah. The um, you did mention at the very beginning uh, using carbon dioxide. I'm, I'm rather aware of that, but it's such an interesting concept. So why don't you talk for a couple more minutes on on supercritical carbon dioxide and why it's mm. an interesting fluid. I wish I could, because it's something that's fairly new to me. So unfortunately, I can't really expand on that, but I'll, I'll bear that in mind and sort of, I can talk about it to future lectures, but it's something being talked about because uh, in one side, carbon dioxide has got a heat, good, heat, good heat capacity and sort of thermodynamics downhole work pretty well. And on the other side, it's, it's a good way of actually getting rid of it in terms of carbon capture. Because yeah. some of it's going to stay down there. So it's uh, killing two birds with one stone in many ways. Yeah, yeah. There's a company in uh, in Houston called Sage. You might probably know. Yeah, yeah. That they um, but they they were looking at the thermodynamics. So they they think it is definitely the way forward. Mm. And indeed, even putting um, not bringing the, the fluid to the surface, but uh, using it to drive uh, turbines downhole. Yes. And therefore, just having a cable going up the well bore, um, which then gets around your issues of, uh, of large, large diameter well bores. But I mean, that, it's early days. Indeed. That's another good thing you touched on there, Tim, because people are talking about putting in downhole turbines and downhole heat exchange to actually extract the energy without bringing it to the surface. So uh, yeah. Yeah. there's lots of ideas being mentioned at the moment. Mm. Again, EVA being another example of 
the closed loop systems where you're you're not looking to buy your formation proxy permeability. Yeah, and the DOE, if, if it doesn't know, is, is, is putting $45 billion towards it, I think, um, rather like they did with Frank. Like and with Tesla. So the DOE, DOE is also responsible for why Tesla is a, a success, which I didn't know until. I didn't know it either. Interesting. <laughs> they did Tesla and then they did fracking. They spent a lot of money on fracking. <laughs> so it worked. Um, that's a tremendous uh, discussion, Tom. Thank you very, very much indeed for uh, sharing your time with us and uh, really interesting. And hey, you know, there's clearly benefits in doing this. We just need to um, unlock a few holy grails of CapEx. Yeah, well, I'll me. say thank you very much for inviting me, Tim. And, and thank you to the members for, for coming along and uh, listening. Say, I do encourage everybody, any questions, you'll, if you're good, you'll be able to find me on LinkedIn. But uh, I'm sure my email address is in the presentation somewhere. And uh, again, but please urge you just take a photo of the uh, QR code. Go to the website and please leave your feedback because uh, I'm keen to hear it just to make this presentation better for future chapters. That's so good. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so um, Steve Dyer has arrived. Steve regrettably was unable to listen to your talk, Tom, because he had a client meeting. But he, was, nah. he's no, he is going to no doubt uh, follow you around the globe and find the next one. <laughs> Uh, so, Steve, why don't you say hello? If I, oh, there you are. Hello. <laughs> that, that, that's true. Uh, yeah, sorry, Tom. I only caught the last five minutes, unfortunately. <laughs> no problem. I'm going to hang around for your presentation because it sounds very interesting. So I'll, uh, no, I'll, no I'll worries, hand over the rights. <laughs> no worries. So what I think we'll do, Steve, is we'll, we'll uh, give people a 10 minute comfort break, um, sure. five or 10 minutes, and then, and yeah, then of course. on and then, then. And uh, so, everybody, uh, I will see you all in five or 10 minutes. I'm tempted to stop the recording and hope I remember to start it again. Perhaps someone couldn't <laughs> find me to start it because I didn't actually start Tom was quite in time. So I'm stopping the recording now, guys, and I'll see you all just before seven o'clock UK time. And shall I leave this slide too up so people have got a chance to grab the QR code? Or would you like yes, to? Please do that. Yes, please do that. Okay. Perfect. In which case, I'll take the opportunity to grab a cup of tea and I'll come back. So again, thank you very much, everybody. Hope you found the presentation interesting. And uh, please go to the DL site and leave your feedback. Thanks.